I think as a creative, you have to enjoy the creative process because that's the only thing you have any control over. Particularly when you try to sell it, when you enter the marketplace, the only thing I can do is enjoy the writing of it, make it the best I can, and I have to enjoy that part of the process where I'm actually doing the creativity or I'm gonna drive myself crazy. Welcome to the Creative Jungle Podcast, where we explore the creative process and fascinating people who have creative courage. Here are your hosts, Artie and Justin. Today, we're welcoming New York Times bestselling children's author, Chris Grabenstein, to the show, winner of way too many awards to list, dating all the way back to a fifth grade essay contest, which I think started his career. And Chris's prolific writing career has captured the imaginations of children around the world with works including the Lemoncello series, the Smartest Kid series, the Dog Squad series, the Wonderland series, the Haunted Mystery series, and the Island of Dr. Libris, which is not a series, but could be, I'm guessing, in the future because you like series, Chris. And with the amount of time it takes to create that many stories, we're thrilled he made the time for our little series. Series, the Creative Jungle Podcast. Chris, welcome to the show. Hey, Artie, great to be here in the jungle with you creative monkeys. There, there we go. For the record, I have teenagers and an elementary student, so we've been reading your books for years. Justin just is starting his family, so he's on the Dr. Seuss level right now, and he'll get yeah, to where you're we going. Haven't graduated. Yeah, we haven't graduated. I've got one for you. I've got one picture book. My next door neighbors both had uh, daughters about the same time. One was named Annalise. One was named Devin, and I would go to book conferences and come home with picture books to give to the kids. And I realized these kids are never going to see their names in a book because Annalise <laughs> and Devin are both kind of unusual names. So I said, I'm going to write a picture book, and the kid's name is going to be Annalise Devin something. So That is uh, the greatest gift you can give somebody, Chris, especially right. in, with the power of your authorship. So, yeah. but, hey, why don't you tell the audience how you started your passion for writing and storytelling and kind of how it led to you being a children's author? Well, it's a really long road. I started out, as you mentioned, in the fifth grade, I entered an essay contest. I grew up in Signal Mountain, Tennessee, which is outside of Chattanooga, Tennessee, and the local Lions Club had an essay contest. I entered and won first prize. And then when I got to junior high school, what's now known as middle school, I had an English teacher who loved to laugh. And I was I said, why do we have to write boring essays when we turn in homework assignments? So I would write this funny stuff. And she really liked it. And she wrote in the margins of one of my papers, you will make your living as a writer someday. So when a teacher gives you that kind of encouragement, you go, eh, maybe that's true. Because, you know, if my parents had said that, I would have said, eh, you're my parents. You get paid to say nice things like that about me. But a teacher, when I was in school, we always had to write an essay. What do you want to be when you grow up? And I used to say, I want to be a doctor or a lawyer or a chemical engineer like my father. But in eighth grade, because that seventh grade teacher inspired me, I said, I want to be a writer or a comedian when I grow up. And I love watching Johnny Carson on those nights when my parents would let me stay up long enough to see Johnny Carson and Rodney Dangerfield and all those kind of comedians when I was a kid. So then I went to high school, I had some more great teachers, and I worked on school newspapers, went to the University of Tennessee in Knoxville, where I worked, I studied uh, journalism, advertising, and broadcasting, uh, but I spent all my time acting in the theater, so I'm still trying to be a writer and a comedian. Then I chucked everything when I was 23, 24, moved to New York City from Tennessee with a one-way ticket and $1,000, no job, no place to stay except a buddy's couch where I could stay for a week. And I started doing improvisational comedy in New York City with a troupe. We had a guy named Bruce Willis in our troupe. He shaved his head, moved to California. We don't know what happened to Bruce. Yeah, he never made it. He never yeah, made he it, Chris. Yeah, he disappeared into the ocean. <laughs> and uh, late Robin Williams, whenever he was in New York City, he loved doing improv and he would seek out. And there were only two improv troops in New York City back then. Now there's, I think, 2,000. So when I was in both. It was called the First Amendment, another one called Chicago City Limits. So Robin Williams would perform with us. We toured colleges, but you made $10 a weekend on a good weekend. And yeah, I supported myself by typing because all that journalism school stuff, I had to be able to type. And then in 1984, I said, eh, I want to find a job where I can be creative every day. So I took an aptitude test, a writing aptitude test that a big advertising agency had come up with as a recruitment tool. And that was J. Walter Thompson Advertising, still one of the biggest in the world. And the guy who wrote that test was James Patterson. So I worked for James Patterson in advertising for four years, but advertising, one of those careers where you have to leave, you make your name, you go to somewhere else and you sort of leapfrog. So I worked at three different advertising agencies over 20 years. And I said, 
by the time I got tired of advertising, like 2000, 2001, I said, oh, James Patterson had a pretty good second career when he quit advertising. He started writing books. So that he was my inspiration. So I went out and I started writing books. My first books I wanted to write were mysteries and thrillers for adults. It took me four years. I finally got one published after four different books were rejected. And as I was writing those, one of the books I wrote was a ghost story for adults, like a Stephen Kingish kind of thing. And my agent was at a party where somebody said, I need a ghost story for middle grade readers. I need a ghost story for middle grade readers. And my agent said, well, Chris wrote this ghost story, but it's not for kids. And uh, the publisher said, well, if it's any good, we can turn it into one. And so he read this <laughs> ghost story and he said, I love it. I love it. But get rid of all the adult situations, adult language and cut 70,000 words out of that manuscript, cut it down from 110,000 down to like 40,000. So I did that, took like another six months to do all that. And that guy left the publishing business. So I'm left with this book. But fortunately, uh, we don't have any kids, my wife and I, but we have a great friends who had kids who were the right age. So I used them as my test readers. They read it and they were running around their Unitarian church going, we love this book, we love this book. And another member of their church was the head of children's publishing at Harper Collins and said, what's this book these kids are talking about? And our friend Dave is a very gregarious fire and FDNY firefighter guy. He goes, ah, Chris wrote the best book. My buddy wrote the best book ever. The kids love it. So the uh, head of children's publishing interviewed these two kids about this book. So they were interested. My agent called up a friend at Random House and said, uh, you know, Harper Collins is interested in this. You might want to see this. And that's how I got started. So my first book was a ghost story for kids. And, you know, when I was writing that book, I realized that I still was kind of 10 or 12 years old in my brain. And I had so much fun doing that. So now I've had 75 different books published. And I think 60 of those are for kids. So that, that, yeah, that's uh, I can't believe, Justin, that Chris has cracked the creative process, which apparently is just surround yourself with people that are going to become legendary in every aspect yeah. of the industry. <laughs> so, yeah, 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 well, Bruce Willis is a great stand-up comedian, right? We know yeah. that. Well, he, he never made it he, as, yeah. He was, but it uh, sounds like more improv. Fun. If you look at what he did in his first breakthrough, which was Moonlighting. Yeah, was that was awesome. Funny in that. And, then, and then he started doing all the tough guy <laughs> stuff. But he was also, he was still very funny in his tough guy thing. I mean, he yeah, made yeah. Die Hard funny in his own yeah. way. So There's like a little sense of humor he, going on there. Yeah, yeah you can see it. Well, you know, it is a very eclectic path that you took and you ran into some very famous people, like I said, legendary in their own industry. Did you develop a creative process to your writing by picking and choosing what you saw from each aspect of those industries? Or have you developed a creative process to, to cause when you, when you're, you're start 75 books is a lot, Chris, and I'm assuming like, you know, people always struggle with, it doesn't seem like you get a lot of writer's block if you're writing that much. You know, you know I always credit it to those five years I spent in that Greenwich Village basement. It was like this, if you ever seen the movie, The Goodbye Girl, where Richard Dreyfuss' character is doing this uh, showcase down in a basement theater that's just the pits, which was kind of what we did. And we did that and we hoped that people would come see us, agents and stuff. But there are, there's only one rule when you do improvisational comedy, and that is to say yes and move the story forward. To take the scene, to say yes to whatever your partner sets up and move it forward. So uh, Tina Fey, who did improv in Chicago, talks about in her book, Bossy Pants, where she says, like, if you're doing a scene and somebody says, wow, it's hot in here, and you go, no, no, I'm, I'm cold, then you've denied, they've like basically wasted their time. You've denied the reality they set up. But if they say, wow, it's hot in here, and you go, yes, it sure is. At least you've acknowledged the reality they've established, but you haven't moved that scene forward. So the and part is, if someone says, wow, it's hot in here, and you go, yeah, I told you we shouldn't have climbed inside this dog's mouth. Now, all of a sudden, you've taken what they've set up and you've moved the scene and you've, it's almost like you're playing tennis and you bounce something back to your partner who said, well, as canine dentist, this is the only way to get in here and examine these canine teeth. We had to shrink ourselves down to this capsule size so we could float around inside this dog's mouth. And all of a sudden, you're off to the races. You have this great scene. So I did that first to say yes and to everything. And that helped me a great deal when I got into advertising because you work with a strategy and you try to come up with a creative uh, expression of that strategy. And if you've ever worked in advertising, you know that uh, for every commercial you see, at least 500 scripts were killed. And most of my friends would drop out. They'd say, that's it. They're not going to buy anything. I'm out of ideas. 
And I would say, oh, there's, I can always say yes and to this and go a different path. And so that helped me out a great deal uh, throughout it. So that, that was one of the great things that helped me. I'm curious about how you were able to jump to a completely new world, children that got there, and hone your craft there and stop saying like, I'm going to write for adults and say, you know what? I'm going to write for kids. I'm going to have a lot more fun. I'm going to yes and with myself as I'm writing these books. How did you completely pivot yourself to that world? Well, you know, I've always been like a nerd and a student. So I, I did research because I had those questions. Like I've been right. Because some of the stuff I wrote that are murder mysteries for adults and kind of scary thrillers, Stephen King kind of spooky stories, or even a couple of my books were sort of James Patterson-esque thrillers. And I said, all right, well, what? They want this to be a kid's book. So I did this. I did some homework. I went out and I got... Uh, Louis Sacker's Holes, which is a great book. I read a book by Carl Hyacin, who wrote for adults, and but he also wrote for kids. He wrote a book called Hoot. And I read that and I started reading those. I was like, oh, okay, I see. This is kind of like, you know, you have to use the fart word every now and then. And you've got to <laughs> keep the sentences out. You got to keep going, you know, in the advertising. We also learn I was doing advertising in the 80s and 90s. And our enemy then was the remote control, right? You had to do something to grab the viewer's attention before they had the five seconds it took to reach for the remote and zap you to go to the next channel. So with kids, that grabbing people's attention becomes even more important and you have to do it constantly. So I sort of said, okay, yeah, I think I know what's going on here. I think I can do this. And then on the first book, I, I use those as my reference points. I looked at the Harry Potter books, the, the first one in particular. And you kind of get a sense for what's going on. I reread some mad magazines. I have quite a collection still of mad books. And so I did it. And it, it was in the process of doing it that I realized that this might be more true to who I am as like a playful person who likes to play fun brain games and, and likes to make up stories that use a lot of imagination. So it was a, a process of discovery. And I got some good encouragement by my first editor at Random House who told me that a lot of people write picture books and a lot of people write young adult, but finding the voice for an, like an eight to 10, an eight to 11 year old is really difficult for them to find because you don't want to talk down to those kids. And at the same time, you don't want to be too above where they are already. So I guess I was just like luckily 10 or 12 in my brain. Our company does a thing, Chris, called uh, we're really engaged in the pre-creative process. We call it find your fascinating. So when we sit down with people, we try to talk about it's not just about for us doing a film or a video or in your case, writing a book. But what's make what makes it fascinating? What's going to hold your attention? What you know, that the remote control thing you just said, when do you know your story is where you need it to be? And, and, and when you write, do you, do, you, do you map it all out first or do you just write and let the story take you where you need to go? Uh, actually, one of the things I did in all those years I was being rejected, you know, I, I would write because I came out of advertising and a lot of the directors we used to film our commercials grew up to become uh, feature film producers like uh, Michael Bay, who does all the Transformer movies, started out doing Diet Dr. Pepper commercials, these incredible ones with trucks going through all these stunts and stuff. And th those yeah, nothing. Like, did anything explode on those commercials? Chris, yeah, he likes yeah, to like, explode like things. There was like a. <laughs> There's one I know a Dr. Pepper truck was going up a drawbridge and these people wanted the Dr. Pepper inside so much they pushed the button and the drawbridge went up to the point that the doors behind the truck expanded open and all the cans came flying out. And these, so, you know, it was that kind of over the top stuff that became kind of an audition piece. I worked with a couple of directors who did, you know, funny movies. So when I left advertising, uh, and that they say everybody in advertising has a screenplay in their desk drawer. So I, I started studying uh, how to write screenplays and started going to seminars. Uh, Robert McKee does this famous story seminar that teaches you the his main trick is if a scene starts negative, it ends positive. If it starts positive, it ends negative. So you start, and I read the Sid Fields books. And recently I have uh, I found this book called Save the Cat, uh, which is a book about screenplay writing, about the 15 beats that are in every screenplay. And there's since been one uh, Save the Cat writes a novel. And I've read that. So I, but their 15 beat structure helps me now. In the olden days, when I first started out and I was just doing everything on spec, I was what they called a pantser, where you write by the seat of your pants and you see what happens next. And some authors 
have said that whenever I know what's going to happen next, I quit for the day. Because you know you, you want to surprise yourself as you're writing. I now put that energy into doing a very detailed outline. And I do follow that uh, 15 beat structure that Save the Cat made uh, famous. And, uh, and that is really helpful because I'm, I'm doing typically two to three books of my own every year and then two or three with James Patterson. So I can no longer be a pure pantser, just like, oh, I don't know how this is going to end up. Let's just, let's just see where the wind blows. I, I think it's interesting to say like, what books are good? But also then you have this, you're at this weird position where you can't write certain things or maybe you have to really think of like the morals or values that you're trying to put in a book as well because Disney has kind of screwed things up with movies like Little Mermaid and things like that, where the plot lines aren't exactly, they're not actually great. They don't teach anything really wonderful. So I wonder how you approach it and what you have to back off and what those story blocks are to make sure that kids are enjoying reading the books and that they get something positive from it. And where you kind of ride that line and how you, how you pull it off. Because there's definitely some books that we read to our, we have a three-year-old that we pull off because it's like Alexander's Horrible No Good Day. I liked reading it until every day woke up and he was quoting things like about how his day was terrible. It was like, no, your day's not terrible. Your day's great. <laughs> what a terrible what day, Dad. <laughs> oh boy. Why is he doing this? Like It took us a while sometimes. Like he wouldn't take a bathtub because it's like, it's too hot. What? It's cold. No, it's not. Your tub is cold. <laughs> it was because of the book. Wow. And we just pulled it off for a little bit because it's like, oh, he's too into this book. But it was a great book. So, yeah. So it's kind of funny, especially little kids. It's different than than 10 year olds. But like, I think that balancing act was interesting. I was very fortunate in my uh, days when I was bumping around doing improv and typing at a bank where I worked. I also got to write for uh, Jim Henson and the Muppets. And I started out doing Dial of Muppets, which you would call it. Remember the, those old 976 numbers it's where you call for sports scores? Or, psychic or, hotline, or, right? Psychic the hotline. Psychic where, hotline. <laughs> and kids could call up and a Muppet would talk to them. And I started writing for those because as a writer, you'll just do anything to get started. And it was fun. I got to you know write for the Muppet voices. Uh, Henson, to his credit, said kids are calling up without getting their parents' permission because it was one of those things that cost like 50 cents every time you dialed one of those numbers or something. And he said, we're going to stop doing that. But that guy's pretty good. Let's have him work on some other stuff. So I got to work on a short-lived TV show called The Little Muppet Monsters. And one day I got to meet Jim Henson and Jane Henson. And I went and presented the script. And I remember the first thing Jim Henson asked me was, what lesson is this script teaching? Because kids are going to take a lesson away from it. So it's always best if you know what the lesson is that you're putting in. So I am always, because of those words reverberate in my head every time I sit down, I'm always aware, like, well, what is the theme? What, at the same time, you don't, you know, if you want a message called Western Union, you don't want to be uh, like really telegraphing a message, hitting kids over the head with it. But it's great if you go in knowing, here's what I think and hope will be the main takeaway from this. And it's a thing that kids, yeah, it would be all right if a kid picked this up from, from this book. You can't just kind of go in willy nilly and say, let's do something and just see where it lands. Yeah, I'm not in my office today, Chris, because I'm actually on location. But if I were in my office, I'd show you on my right side of my desk, I have a big poster of Jim Henson. On my uh -huh. left side, I have, a, I have a big poster of Robin Williams. And both quotes are about imagination and about never losing your imagination or that spark for imagination. And I think it's kind of like what kind of drives our passion for creativity and why we're doing this podcast it really comes down to a couple of things. You know, Justin and I talk about this all the time. It's somewhere along the way, you think like adults lose their passion for creativity and imagination that a kid tends to still have for a very long time. They just see the world differently. Now that, you know, as you started to get out of the ad agency and you working with the Muppets and now that you're doing children's book, do you, you, do you get the sensibility that kids do have a different way that they go about creativity and their imagination? Yeah, I think that, that they still have that playfulness. Who was it that said everyone's born a genius? It's hard to hold on to it. I think Picasso or somebody said something like that. And it's interesting you mentioned uh, Jim Henson and Robin Williams. Knowing that I worked with both of those people, I put them together to create my most famous character, Luigi Lemoncello. Because oh, really? Uh, yeah, because Lu Luigi Lemoncello has the creativity and the financial resources. By the time I met Jim Henson, 
He had the most incredible five-story brownstone on the east side of Manhattan office building where all the furniture, you know, we say furniture have legs. All of his actually had legs that were sculpted to look like characters. There was a puppet Gonzo. Every time you opened the front door of this brownstone, this Gonzo would automatically hold up a big flash camera and a flash would explode. So he just had, yeah, he had all the money in the world. He had this huge imagination. And so he built this playland. And then Robin Williams was that spontaneous, spontaneous, spontaneous uh, improvisational spirit. Uh, so yeah, those are the two I put together. And I think, uh, I remember when I was in advertising, going to so many meetings with so many people who had MBAs. And I said, these people have all forgotten how to dream up ideas, which is why they need to hire creatives at an advertising agency to be the kids for them. You know, yeah, why do you think that happens? I think we squeeze it out. We get serious. You know, what do you want to be when you grow up? That's a silly idea. You can't make money coming up with stories or doing playing with puppets or doing funny voices. Or you need to, you know, you need to, here's the numbers and the numbers make things safe. I, I knew that MBAs often would kill advertising and thought that I don't like the ideas, but the numbers tell me to make this decision. And so they, you start relying on things that are solid. And as one of my uh, creative bosses said to me once, when I was like a young junior copywriter and you're only making like 15, $20,000 a year, uh, but so you have more ideas because you're, because I presented one idea once that was kind of out there on the edge and they said, oh, we, we can't show that. And I said, why not? And he said, Chris, how big is your mortgage? Because you know, as you get older, you start worrying about things like mortgage and my kids need braces and I got to send these kids to college. And so the, you become more risk averse. And uh, I think too much of corporate world champions risk averseness. Yeah. Don't take any risks. Don't, don't take any big risks. Until somebody does take a big risk, why didn't we take a risk like they took? A lot of our clients and, and how we approach creative, we talk about creative courage. And it's actually the, the it's actually explaining what you're talking about is like we walk into these places and say you need to have creative courage, which is like, if you have a great idea, let's do it. Let's 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 talk about the big idea. Let's let's move forward with that. And I think that's important. But it is true. It's like somewhere along the way, people just got kind of afraid. And it leads me to my next question is like, doesn't seem when you were in the ad agency, you must've got rejected a lot, Chris, between like ads being, we, we know that situation where you, you're in front of a, a board member and they go, I don't get it. And you're like, what are you talking about? This is brilliant. This is the funniest thing you've ever seen. And they're like, I don't get it. And you just leave it on the table. But even in your, before you became successful with your books, I'm sure books were rejected left and right. How do you, how do you stay on the path with your creative courage to do what you want and to continue your creative path, your creative process when, it, when you're getting all this negativity and rejection? It's funny, it reminded me when I, because I was an actor. So I went to, you know, like 10 auditions a week that I got rejected at. And when I decided to get into advertising, I said, why, why do you want to be right, become a copywriter? I said, I want to find something that's a little more stable. And they said, only someone who had been an actor would think that about advertising because you're going to get rejected here all the time. I never took it, and I don't know why I didn't, maybe because I never uh, had amb- my My goal was never to make a lot of money. If that Makes sense. My goal was to have fun. I think something I grew up, my father never liked his job. He never once came home and said, Hey guys, guess what happened at work today? Oh, you'd ask him, How was work? Fine. What's for dinner? You know, it, he did not like what he did. If I, some of my friends from high school reminded me, ever since I was a kid, I didn't care about making money. I cared about having fun doing what I was doing. So as long as writing advertising copy was fun and I had enough money to buy pizza on Saturday, then I was okay. You know, I, 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 my goal was to enjoy the creative process. And that's something I always have to remind myself, like you're doing this because it's, it's fun, you know? And uh, yeah, I did get to a point where I was an executive vice president, group creative director, and all of a sudden now, and, and James Patterson and I talk about this because he was a creative director and you start taking on the responsibility of it, not just being a fun idea. But if the client doesn't like this fun idea, then we're going to have to fire 30 people here at the advertising agency. So I guess life does that to you. As you move up, you take on more responsibilities and maybe you become a little more risk averse. One of my favorite scenes in a movie is one that Tom Hanks did with Jackie Gleason called Nothing in Common. And he becomes a big executive at the ad agency and they have a big pitch coming up 
and he has, I think the first scene in the movie, he's got his first office with a window and there, someone's giving him Windex with a ribbon on it because he could clean the window. And I remember my first office with a window. But when it, the pressure is on and it's time he's got to come up with a big idea, he tells everybody to go back to the cubicle that he worked in where he had his best ideas. Like so the whole ad agency is crowded into this cubicle because that's where he did his best thinking back in the days when he didn't have all the pressure of the window and stuff. So somehow when we're being creative, we have to block out all that noise and go back to finding that initial spark. Of what made me want to do this wacky stuff? And it really comes down to playing and having fun. And, and I used to call it making myself giggle. Like if it's something that makes the tickles my, me, maybe it'll tickle somebody else. And, and you kind of have to go back to that route. I mean, that really resonates with, I would assume me and Artie, but I think of some like our early shoots seven years ago when we didn't even have like great cases for our gear, but it was fun. Yeah. <laughs> Longer days, a lot more work, a lot more figuring it out, a lot more mistakes, but it definitely made it more interesting and more fun to always be curious and playing and not really know what could go wrong. And it becomes tougher to put yourself in those scenarios as the stakes get higher, like you said. Yeah. Um, but the key is continuing to do it. Let's say you were to sit at your coffee table tomorrow. I'm making assumptions. You might go somewhere entirely different for starting things out. Is there a moment where you say, this is the pin drop of the start of something new, or I need to create a thing? Or is it more fluid where you know, you're just out and about and pop? Your neighbor tells you their daughter's name and you say, that's a weird name. That should be a book. Like uh, yeah, talk through the starting point and, and where it goes from there. A lot of it's very interesting. When I was uh, the boss in advertising, all of my uh, copywriters and art directors got used to be coming in and saying, Buster had an idea this morning because a lot of my ideas would come walking my dog. And I've since, since done, there's a great book that someone who worked at J. Walter Thompson was asked so many times, where do ideas come from? They wrote a really thin little book and I can't remember the name of it. A, a Technique for Producing Ideas, I think it was. James Webb Young, I might, uh, I might be getting that wrong. But he wrote this thin little book and in there he, he detailed the process and I realized it was the process that I was doing every time I came up with an idea. As you do some logical research, you dig into like if, if you're doing a commercial for Burger King and you know they flame broil they don't fry their burgers they can customize your burger they can put in uh, pickles on there if you want them they don't want them everyone else so you get all this logical stuff and then you sit down and you write all the first ideas like flame broiling sure tastes better than than frying doesn't it wouldn't you agree you know like you're coming up these kind of really logical thesis that go around around with that idea and then his third step I think if I'm remembering correctly is to leave it behind. Go to the movie, go to a play, walk the dog, take a shower, and let your conscious brain, which has all this data that you've been churning, connect somehow to your subconscious brain. And that's where an idea comes from. That an idea comes from two old ideas kind of bumping into each other. So for instance, my wife came home and told me a funny story. She said, oh, I was out walking. We had a dog named Fred. I was out walking Fred and we have a little park near us and there was a family with a stroller and the baby in the stroller was going, I don't want to take a nap. I don't want to take a nap. And JJ trying to help out said, well, Fred, my dog here, he loves to take naps. If you don't want to take that nap, Fred will happily take it for you. And there was an old man on the park bench who went, I like to take naps too. I'll take that nap for you, little girl. So she came home and told me that funny little story about something that happened on the street. And I said, yes, we now have our picture book that Annalise Devin McFleece is going to be the girl who does not want to take a nap. So her father takes her out. Oh, so I always start out with a what if. What if there was a girl who didn't want to take a nap and she went out into public and she let everyone know she did not want to take a nap. And one person heard that and said, well, I like taking naps. I'll take it for you. And someone else heard that and said, I'll take that nap. And before long, everybody in the whole city is taking a nap. And so fun scenes of everybody sleeping. The dog walkers are sleeping with their dogs. Even the squirrels in the trees are taking naps. There's people on skateboards who just knocked over. There's people in libraries sleeping. And the only one still awake is this little girl. She wants to take a nap now, but all the naps are taken 
Fortunately, at the end, there's a cat who's taking so many naps and he has naps to spare and gives one to her. So that whole story starts from one little story that you soak up, one little thing, and you make a strange connection to it. And you've gotten to the level now, Chris, where I think it's, you know, it's interesting because you yourself have become an entity. Do you feel the pressure every book now? Do you, you know, how do you keep that creative process going for you so that, uh, you know, I, we, the, the proverbial writer's block is what we bring up all the time, but I mean, I don't want to, you know, maybe you don't feel the pressure, but I, I just, I always think about like when you get to a certain level, Justin and I are feeling it now with our business. It's like, there's that pressure to succeed, to be better than you were the last time. You're always remembered for your last thing, right? So right. talk to me about how success may play a role in your creative process and how you go about it. It does. The pressure gets there. I'm very uh, lucky. I, uh, Charlene Harris, who wrote the Suki Sackhouse uh, vampire books that became True Blood on HBO. Uh, it was a friend of mine in the mystery world. And she said, oh, yeah, there's nothing better than seeing your book on the New York Times bestseller list until you write the next book. And then all of a sudden you're going, is it going to be on the bestseller list? Is it going to be on the bestseller list? Who did it get as high as my last one? So you can really drive yourself crazy uh, with that kind of stuff. I am very fortunate that I have my wife is a great partner of mine on everything I do. And, you know, you need an honest critic. And so she is my honest critic. She doesn't go, oh, you're great. You're good. She'll let me know. I first book I gave her, I said, if anything bores you, take care of the story, let me know. And she's been great. She's read everything I've written uh, before anyone else. We wrote a book together now. We're working on another project together. So it's good to have that. I also am lucky I have good agents and I have a good editor that I've done most of my work with. And I have James Patterson, you know, and, but, you know, we all get down, you know, it's all like, I don't know why that didn't work. I thought that would have worked. You know, it's not, there is no guarantee. So what I guess I learned in advertising, I learned it pretty quickly because they kill so many scripts. There's, there's so much, we used to have a, a festival in the ad agency called Day of the Dead, where everyone brought out like their favorite storyboards that had been killed throughout the year. And we gave out prizes like, oh yeah, that one, definitely should have gotten done. I mean, there are so many storyboards that didn't get done. And I used to, I mean, early on, I drove myself crazy. Like, why can't I sell this? Why can't I sell this? If I fix this, I can sell it. And then I realized the only thing I can do is enjoy the writing of it, make it the best I can. And I have to enjoy that part of the process where I'm actually doing the creativity or I'm going to drive myself crazy. Because there were some people in advertising, it was all about producing, winning awards. And if you really focus on that stuff, you will drive yourself crazy. So you, I think as a creative, you have to enjoy the creative process because that's the only thing you have any control over, particularly when you try to sell it. When you enter the marketplace, you have no control over what you're selling is what someone is buying today. You know, my first three books, four books were rejected. But I got nice rejection letters saying, yeah, you know how to write. These are great stories, but yeah, no one's looking for that story right now. So let us look at the next thing you write. Maybe you will hit. And there's no way to predict when lightning is going to strike. My book, Escape from Mr. Lemoncello's Library, which went on to spend 111 weeks in the top 10 of the bestseller list. It's won, I think, like 24 state book awards. It's been translated into 20 some different languages. It almost never got published because... I worked on that book for two years and my editor kept pushing me because I had the word library in the title. His boss had said, where's this book that you promised us? Uh, just have him skip that one and write another one of those ghost stories and we'll be done with his contract. But my editor stuck with it and we kept going. So uh, I had no control over all that stuff. All I could do is write the best story I could. Have you ever looped kids into a creative process and done sort of a yes and even without that, the, maybe they don't even realize it, but your process is weaving them in at an event or in some way looping them in without them even knowing. Because I could imagine that like those types of creative meetings would be very different than a creative meeting with a bunch of other adults or like uh, James Patterson, like you mentioned, like yeah. he, he's just boxed into the way he thinks and the experiences he's had as, and what childhood meant to him, which was very different to what it might mean to a child yeah. now. Yes, if we're doing something brand new, we find what we call beta readers. I'll, you know, used to, I live in a big apartment building here in New York City, so there's kids all over the place, but most of them are starting to grow up now. I'm starting to lose my eight, nine, 10-year-olds. 
but I'd find kids here in the building or I'd find some of my biggest fans online and we'd say, uh, could you look at this? And the kids would read the manuscript and then I'd take them out for cocoa and cookies or something and they'd uh, have like a little focus group and talk about them. And another thing that I don't get to do it now, though I do a lot of virtual school visits, but when I do my in-person school visits, I the whole thing is about how to beat writer's block. That's my whole little, I talk a lot about the books I've written and a lot of educational stuff, but the core of my presentation is when kids come into the auditorium, I get like six or seven of them write one word on a card. And then I put those cards in my back pocket and we forget about them. But then I start doing my whole presentation and I show them this book, this book, and I say, yes, I've written 72 books or whatever it is. And then I turn to the kids and I say, but I know what you're thinking. You've written for the Muppets. You've written that made for TV movie with John Denny. You've written all these books, but can you write something right now? And the kids go, I said, what do you think? Can I? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I said, yes, I can if you help me out. So then I stop. Oh, but I just remember something. I haven't written anything all day. My brain might be rusty. I may not be firing on all cylinders. I might have the dreaded writer's block. Do any of you kids know, and it's fascinating, you go to school, third graders know what writer's block is. Kids who are eight years old are already having writer's block. So I said, okay, that should happen to me, even though I'm a trained professional. This is why I'm glad I have some emergency words standing by. I've got those words in my back pocket. If I get to a store, part of the story where I don't know what to say next, I'm going to reach into my pocket, pull out one of those words, and whatever that word is, it has to be the next word in my story. But this time the kids are all laughing because they remember some of the funny words they wrote down on those cards. And then I proceed to tell the story and pretend to have writer's block and I pull out the word and it could be fart and that has to be the next word and I keep the story going from wherever that took me to. Because what I'm trying to show people is that writer's block comes from trying to make something perfect the first time through. And if you realize that it took me two and a half years to write Escape from Mr. Lemoncello's Library, that the whole process of writing is rewriting, then you understand that nobody gets it right the first time. So why are you trying to drive yourself crazy getting it right the first time? Get something down on paper, or in this case, in the ether, I just kind of make up the story and throw it out into the air. Then once that's down, you've got something and you might stumble onto some wild connections and you can go back and make it better. So that's my whole thing. And it all goes back to, that's basically a, a scene we used to do in the improv show where you get first sentence, last sentence. And when we did it in front of an audience, we would stop and the audience would yell out a word. You can't do that with 300 kids in a cafeteria. I have since learned. So we do the thing. This is reminding me very much of an experience I'm having right now where five weeks ago, I roughed out some scripts for something. And uh, I thought they were pretty decent, like not great, but at least like, something to critique and build on and go and move. And we're working with an agency on this same thing. And they wanted a month and a half to work on it. And I was like, no, 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 no. let's just hop in Google Docs. We're gonna do this together. We already have the bones of this thing. Like, let's go, let's have fun. Let's just, just like throw ideas around. <laughs> and it just felt so different to their process where they want to only present the client with the polished thing. It's like, well, it's a client you've had for years you should be presenting them with unpolished things. And like, it can be a bit more fun and inclusive and collaborative. And I think that's a tough thing for adults to realize too. Yeah. And I think getting the energy for those kids and uh, hearing the silly words they come up with, what are they laughing at? That keeps me in touch with how to appeal to them. Cause you know, I'm not 12 years old anymore. And it's really hard to, to make sure you're being relevant without being Uncle Morty coming down to the rec room going, hey, kids, what's happening? What are we grooving on? You know, trying really hard to be. But fart still works. I'm going to try fart, using that. Fart now. always works. Yeah, we fart should. Time. Uh, there's another uh, children's book author who gives a really fun presentation about what kids find funny. And the three funniest words are fart, poop, and underpants. So there you go. Before I move on, is there anything you'd like to plug, Chris? Any books coming out? Any movies coming out? Any magazine articles or funny <laughs> pictures of you we should be aware of? Uh, at the end of November, the sequel, uh, a new series that we got started called The Smartest Kid in the Universe, which has a good what-if story behind it. I was out just walking one day, and I don't know why my brain drifted off to 
my least favorite Halloween candy, Smarties, those little pastel ones that are wrapped up in the plastic. Sure. I said, and then I remembered being in London shooting a commercial and they have a type of M&Ms called Smarties. And I don't know, I was just out walking. And I said, what if I could eat Smarties and become a Smartie? And that book is The Smartest Kid in the Universe, Genius Camp, and it's available now. You can head over to Chris's website, chrisgrabenstein.com to order yours today. But before we go, Chris, let's see how much of a genius you are about yourself with our bonus section. It's time for the bonus features. Our last segment, Chris, is our, uh, like at the end of the old DVDs, the DVD, the bonus features. We like to do bonus features where Justin and I will randomly ask you questions um, that you're not prepared for. So if you don't have All the right. answer, that's cool, but they're pretty easy. Like my first one is in today's digital media world, what's the value of the physical book to you? Do you still like the physical book? Have you moved on to digital? Do you like to hold it? What, like what's, Give me, give me a percentage physical book over digital book to, for you. Well, living in Manhattan, we don't have as much bookshelf storage as we, well, actually we remodeled it now we do. So I, I am a big Kindle person. I have to admit, I love the uh, free sample feature where you get to read like uh, the first couple chapters because I'm still a reluctant reader. And if you don't grab me in those first three chapters, I'm not going to read the rest of your book. But I do like the physical book and I know kids love the physical book. Not many kids read on devices that I was told 10 years ago, oh, yes, all the six years are going to have iPads and they're all going to do all their, they're not even going to carry books to school. But kids love the physical book, the feel, the smell, and there's just something about getting lost in those pages. When you uh, when you were coming up with uh, Dr. Lemoncello, I, I read that with my son. My son read it multiple times. My youngest daughter actually likes the TV show better. Just to let you know, Chris, she does okay. like the show. There's a lot of Willy Wonka in there. Were you inspired by Willy Wonka? And, and when you were growing up, what was your favorite book series slash book that was your go-to book? Uh, when I was growing up, unfortunately, I grew up in the 60s, 70s. When I was the age that all my readers are, there was this uh, educational craze sweeping the land called SRA, where we did not read books in school. We had this big box of color-coded essays. And if you read the red ones, you got to read the blue ones. And so we didn't read any books in school. We, at the end of the year, we might read something like the Red Badge of Courage written in 1860 something. And, and so most of my reading uh, was Mad Magazine was my favorite when I was a kid. I had my first subscription to Mad Magazine starting at age 10. And I would save up all my you know, allowance money. And over the summer, I'd go buy Mad Books when we went to St. Petersburg, Florida on vacation. I would get the collection books that they came out with. I still have, you can see a bunch of them back there behind me now. So that was my go-to book as a kid. Yeah, one of my best friends looked exactly like Alfred E. Newman. And <laughs> we used to call him Alfie for short, even though his name was not Alfie. So it was pretty funny. Weirdest character you've come up with that will probably never have a book around it. So do you have any characters like that that you, you love the idea of it? You haven't written a book for it yet. And obviously, like, I'm sure you can't give away secrets, but yeah, anything like that stick out in your mind. Yeah, there was one uh, book series. I had an idea called Super Duper Dude. My idea was that superhero-ness is a gene that skips a generation. You know, they said, if your father was bald, don't worry, you won't be bald. But if your grandfather was bald, be careful. So I said, superhero-ness is a gene that skips a generation. So there's a kid who was on his 13th birthday. All of a sudden he realizes he can float. He can do some superpower stuff. Turns out that his father's kept a secret from him for all these years that your grandfather was a superhero and now lives in a retirement village in Florida with all the other geriatric superheroes. And I had like Elastic Lady who's kind of lost some of her elasticity. And uh, there are all these old superheroes who still have a little bit of their superpower left, but they just don't have what, and it was a hysterical idea. And uh, the kids are going to go train in Florida because there's going to be superhero kids all over the world. who are going to come to Florida and train at this old folks home with the old superheroes. And there's new uh, supervillains who are going through the same thing. But uh, that never got anywhere. So that was, that's a fun one that I would like to do someday. And I have to ask this. There might, there might not be an answer for this, but you do talk about your improv and Robin Williams and Bruce Willis. Can you tell me anything that happened with Robin Williams that stuck in your mind after all these years? Because he always tends to leave something behind. He was the shyest person I've ever met in my life, which was amazing. We were backstage and we had just done some bit, you know, we said like little bits like interview or poet's corner and stuff. And he came back and said, you think they liked it? I think, I think they kind of liked it. 
said, you're Robin freaking Williams. <laughs> They're like laughing their heads off. But he was the shyest, sweetest person off stage, which probably explained why he had to be so zany on stage. I think a lot of uh, performers are introverts who have figured out how to pretend to be extroverts. My son, who is, a, as everybody knows, in my life is a ferocious reader. He read at the age of like three or four, Chris. He never stopped reading. And somewhere along the way, his favorite two series were Lemony Snicket's Unfortunate Events and you, Chris, just read everything that you ever did. And he just was like, boom. So I used to take him, I still take him to book fair so he can meet his favorite authors, which I'm so happy that you guys are accessible. And this happened in Boston. I'm going to share the screen because I have the picture. So hopefully you can see that. Oh, there it is. You guys and, see that. Um, so about five years ago, I pulled my son from school early because I got an email saying that you were going to be in Boston, the Boston area at a book signing. And I'm like, I'm going to surprise him. This will be the, the best thing that ever happened, blah, blah, blah. Pull it from school. We drive up early. We're sitting around the bookstore. There's just us. Nobody's really there. Another little boy showed up. He stayed there for a while. I'm saying, are we in the right place? I went up to the desk. Are we in the right place? All of a sudden you walk in and I'm like, well, there's Chris. And the, where I'm going with this, Justin, is nobody else showed up. This was like a one-on-one -on -one with Jace, my son. And Chris, you were so gracious. I mean, it probably was very uncomfortable for you being the only author there of, of note, but without having an audience, you sat for like 45 minutes with my son and we had great conversations about Robin Williams, about writing. And he was very shy, very quiet. I think I bought six or seven books just because, Chris, because I felt bad. I was like, oh, man, you drove all this way and stuff. But, man, I can't tell you how gracious I am for that. And I think the passion that you left with him about writing, he continues to write to this day. I just wanted to t tell you from my heart, thank you for that, because I don't know if you know the impact you have on kids. But that's a one on one thing that really I think will change his life for the rest of his life. And I hope that uh, you appreciate that. And I appreciate you being on the show. So, well, thank you. And that, that's a story I tell to authors because, you know, that, that's, that's going to happen, but you have to remember that the, whoever is coming to see you uh, has, has made a great effort to come see you. And if it's only one person, then that's great to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with them. And uh, I try to do that. It might be left over again from the improv days where we used to do when we were first starting out, before we got like any New York Times reviews or anything, we sometimes did that show for three people <laughs> sitting at these little cafe tables. And, you know, eventually it grew over time. But uh, to those people, uh, they may only be one person, but it could be the whole, you could be the whole world to them. So you just yeah. got to remember it's, it's kind of like a precious compact, especially if you're writing for kids, you know. It sounds like you're a seventh or eighth grade teacher to to Jace here. So yeah, maybe so, you know, that's what the, yeah. I tell teachers that story. Like you have the power, you know, we all do. We all, you know, the, the path we cut, uh, we don't know who we're influencing. It's a wonderful life. That's my favorite movie because you never know like all the lives you're touching. So just be conscious of what you're doing out there. Oh, we'll, we'll, we'll wait for the bells. Ding, ding. <laughs> <laughs> appreciate right. it, Chris. Thank right. you so much. Thank I appreciate you guys it. so much. The Creative Jungle Podcast is a product of Animus Studios. Explore our creative process at animusstudios.com.